Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 253 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is best selling fantasy author Neil Gaiman. Among his many works, some of my personal favorites include the Sandman series of graphic novels, the fairy tale novel Stardust, which was adapted into a feature film starring Claire Danes and Michelle Pfeiffer, and the short stories Snow Glass Apples, a retelling of Snow White from the point of view of the Wicked Queen, and A Study in Emerald, a Sherlock Holmes story set in an alternate version of Victorian London ruled by Lovecraftian monsters. And we'll be speaking with Neil today about his novel American Gods. A TV adaptation of the book will premiere on the Stars Network on April 30th. And if you're a longtime listener of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy, you may remember that back in episode 100, we listed Stephen King and Neil Gaiman as the two authors we were most hoping to feature on the show. And here we are, just a quick 153 episodes later, and we finally got an interview with Neil Gaiman, so we really hope you enjoy it. And if anyone out there knows Stephen King, please put in a good word for us. Thanks. All right, and so now here's our interview with Neil Gaiman. All right, so we're here with Neil Gaiman. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm sitting here with the new Folio Society edition of American Gods, and it's just this beautiful book. Could you just talk a little bit about how this came about? Um, actually, that one, in terms of things that I have had anything to do with, is probably the least in the world. Uh, because the Folio Society is this amazing publisher in London. And they find books that they consider classics or important. And then they do illustrated editions of them. And they go and find the, uh, the illustrator. And then they also work through the text and do the best possible version of the text. I noticed that it's, this is a restored edition. It has stuff that wasn't in the, uh, the original publication. It does. Um, and it, it actually has stuff that has never been correct ever, <laughs> including things that um, there, there was one place where they spotted a poem that I had left half a line out of when I had transcribed it years ago. Um, so it's a uh, it's one of those things where it's just been such such a delight. Dave McKean, who I've worked with now since we were both 23, 22, 23, something like that. Um, actually, no, he would have been 22. I would have been 25 going on 26. And which means we've been working together for 30 years. And I still think he's the most amazing artist I've ever worked with. And he did the art. And uh, I, my, you know, I, my jaw dropped when I saw the illustrations online. Um, and then my jaw dropped again when I actually got to hold one of these things. I agree. The art is really, really amazing. I was kind of curious when you see this, this Dave McKean art, do you, is your reaction kind of like, that's how I always pictured it in my head or sort of like, I never could have imagined that. Uh, I never could have imagined that. That's always how my reaction is to Dave McKean stuff. It's like, that is not what I saw in my head. That is, but, oh my God, you are such an amazing artist and I'm glad you exist. <laughs> I was also, I was just looking over the book and I was remembering that you mentioned Roger Zelazny in the dedication and Roger Zelazny is my favorite author. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how you encountered him and what sort of an impact he had on you. Roger, well, I, I first encountered Roger as a boy. And that was Roger as an author. Um, and I fell in love with his works, with Lord of Light, with um, Creatures of Light and Darkness. He, he, he was an author who long before me went and took people, uh, the gods of myth and characters from ancient myth and built new stories about them. Um, and I got to know Roger in my later years, uh, when I moved to America, I did a signing once next to him and we were guests at a convention in about 93, I think, together. And, and we would talk on the phone and then he died very suddenly uh, of liver cancer. And um, it took us all by surprise. And 
he and author Kathy Acker, uh, who was also a very dear friend of mine, died just before I started writing the book, and it seemed like a good idea to dedicate it to both of them. It was sort of a funny story because you said that the first time you met Roger Zelazny, you were really looking forward to talking to him. You were doing the signing together, and then you didn't actually get to talk to him at all. Um, well, when when we were signing, we didn't get uh, we barely got to talk because back then he was Roger Zelazny, and I was just the guy who'd done a Sandman book. Hmm. Um, so he had a line of people, and I had maybe ten people, and I signed for them, and then sat next to Roger. And finally, when his line was done, I got to give him a copy of the Sandman book and say, this is for you. Um, so you've said that he had a bigger influence on you probably than any other author. Would you say that there's a big Zelazny influence on American Gods? Um, not in the prose and probably not in anything other than the, the fundamental idea Um which is that you can write mythic creatures, you can write the gods of myth, and they will um, they will be wonderful. They will be human, they will be real, they will be true. Um, and that was that was something that he did so beautifully in all of his fiction is take characters who were who were mythic ideas and make them make them true. Yeah. I also just read your book, The View from the Cheap Seats, and I thought it was interesting because there's a piece that you wrote while you were working on American Gods, and you say that the title, the working, that American Gods is the working title, but that the book will not be called American Gods. And I was just curious how it happens that why you thought it wouldn't be called American Gods and why that changed. American Gods felt like a working title. I just went, ah, oh, okay, and, and and bear in mind that you know I. I I'd come up with the idea maybe four days before that. This is that I was in Scandinavia. This was my first chance to actually um, write up my ideas. I thought, okay, I'll call it, I could call it American Gods. It's like, I've got to come up with something better than that. <laughs> um, and I, I, I wrote down, it'll be, it'll be American Gods or something better. Sent it off to uh, my wonderful editor at the time, a lady named Jennifer Hershey. And uh, Jen, waiting for me by the time I got home from my Scandinavian trip, was the cover of American Gods, and actually the cover of the book several years later. And uh, and it said American Gods at the top, and it said Neil Gaiman at the bottom, or possibly vice versa. <laughs> and it had a big road with the lightning strike on it. <laughs> I mean, do you... In the years since this book has come out, I mean, it's been out for a while now. Have any of the reactions that you've gotten from people, do, that, do any of those really stick out in your mind? Really, I think what, what's been interesting for me mostly is the way that people react to it. Um, because I was very used up till that point of people either liking what I do or, not, or just not reading it. You know, there wasn't anybody who seemed to go, oh, my God, I hate Sandman. It was either, yeah, I really like Sandman, or it's like, I don't read Sandman. Maybe I read, I picked up a Sandman, it wasn't for me, whatever. Whereas when American Gods came out, I would find people who loved it, people who liked it, and people who hated it. And that phenomenon fascinated me. Still does. <laughs> All right, and so we're talking to you today because American Gods is now a new TV show on Stars, and you're listed as an executive producer. So what exactly does that involve? Um... Well, in the case of American Gods, it means I went out. I had an idea of what kind of TV show I thought it should be. Um, went out to the Stars Network with the people from Fremantle Films, who were going to be the studio. Uh, pitched it to them. Um, and having pitched it to them, um, then went off with the people from Fremantle we flew up, uh, me and Stephanie Burke from Fremantle flew to Toronto. I met Brian Fuller in the lobby of a Shangri-La hotel and uh, talked to him for a couple of hours about American Gods and what it would take to turn it into a TV series and what my ideas were and what, what he thought. And a few weeks later, he thought about it and said, okay, he was in. 
And Stars said yes. And then it was a process of helping oversee, uh, you know, reading the scripts as they came in and having commentary, um, doing um, casting, helping with casting, watching. I, I, I was told recently that there were actually 1,200 different people auditioned for Shadow. I think I saw probably 600 of those tapes. Um, and then helping, you know, give input and suggestions on what came after, occasionally even doing tiny little writing things on the side or being there for Brian and Michael, our showrunners, and our, our, who wrote most of the things when they would have queries about how things worked or what to do. I mean, are there any bits that you wrote that you can think of that you're uh, that are interesting to point out? Um, on the beginning of episode five, there's a sequence that's actually uh, animated, and uh, it had uh, the the writer of that episode had written it had written some narration for it. Um, by the time the animation was done, and we looked at it, the narration that was written didn't quite fit with uh, with what was animated and it didn't quite work as a whole. Um, and I called uh, uh, Michael up, Michael Green, and I said, Michael, you know, it needs to be, we need some new narration there because it doesn't, what we've got just doesn't really work. And he said, you're quite right. When can you get it to us by? <laughs> so that was, that was, how I, you know, that's that's a sequence that I wound up just writing, but or at least rewrite. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that because you know I've watched the first four episodes, but not number five. So I'll, I'll keep an eye out for your uh, your animated sequence there. Awesome. Um, I saw that you created a new character, Vulcan, just for the show. Could you talk about that? Uh, well, a few years ago when I was in Birmingham, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, um, I was on looking around the city, being shown around by friends and uh, was taken to the huge statue of Vulcan on the outside of Birmingham, um, where Birmingham, got to say it the American way because it is the American city <laughs> as opposed to the English one. Um, and... Uh, shown around, saw it, um, thought, this is amazing, I have a giant statue here to a god, and then discovered that uh, in Birmingham, the steel mills that had once been the, the, the foundation of the prosperity of the city um, used to have several... Um, several deaths a year of people falling into huge vats of, of molten metal and uh, never really did anything to fix this because it was actually cheaper for them to have people fall into vats of molten metal and send a $50,000 payment to the family than it was to close down the factory for the three days it would take to put in uh, safety railings and things. So that that fascinated me, the idea that you had a god here in America who was actually being sacrificed to. And I just talked to Brian and Michael. I, I mentioned that as the thing that fascinated me that I might use at some point in an American God sequel. And they came to me and said, actually, we're gonna we're gonna use that thing that you were telling us about and uh, put it into into episode six, and which they they went off and did. Were there any other gods or characters that you considered adding for the TV show? Um, there will be a bunch more characters in American Gods who get tiny walk-on point parts or appear in lists who we never actually see and who never talk, and they're going to get to talk. <laughs> I also know you recently did this Norse mythology book, this retellings of Norse mythology, and I was wondering if that 
give you any new thoughts about these characters from Norse mythology, particularly Odin, who appears as a character in American Gods? You know, um, it was it was a real delight doing the Norse mythology book. Um, mostly, it just reminded me how much I love the Eddas and the characters in the prose Eddas. Um, and it also reminded me how incredibly unreliable Odin is. He's probably the most unreliable god there ever was. You know, Zeus or those gods, they may... Um, and, you know, most, most gods who are like at the head of their pantheon are relatively trustworthy. Um, Odin has his own agenda, and it's a very strange one. That's interesting because, you, you know, people think of Loki as being the trickster god. You might think that he would be the most unreliable. Um, well, yeah, he's allowed to be unreliable. But Odin is actually much more unreliable because you don't know what he's thinking. You know he has plans, but you don't know what they are. The most, in, in some ways, weirdly, the most important line of dialogue in the whole of the Eddas is said by Odin to Balder. It's something Odin whispers in Balder's ear when Odin, when Balder is on his funeral pyre. And nobody knows what it is. <laughs> I was curious, you know, I noticed that stars, they have this quiz up uh, at whatdoyouworship.com that you answer some questions and it'll tell you which god from American gods you worship. I was just curious if you've taken that quiz. Uh, no, I've, I've been busy. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you, I, I took it and I got the technical boy, which is probably not a big surprise. Awesome. Um, I was going to say, anybody who works for Wired, getting the technical boy is hilarious. Yeah. I thought it was interesting because in the book, American Gods, the technical boy character is sort of overweight and dresses like somebody out of the Matrix. And the character in the TV show is much different from that. I was wondering, does that reflect kind of how the internet culture has evolved since 2001? Um, you know, the, I think it, 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 it's how the world has changed since then. Um, the, the character that I was writing in 1998, 1999, 2000, uh, for a book published in 2001, um, was sort of the archetypal quintessential geek. And uh, he was, you know, a fat kid in a limo smoking hand-rolled toadskin cigarettes. Uh, but what's weird is, so we've, we've updated him now in this wonderful world where, uh, you know, anyone who loves technology, we have come out of our mother's basements. And uh, we are we are on our phones all the time. Technology is no longer something you have to go and seek out. I remember when I wanted to buy a cable. You know, if you wanted to buy a computer cable, you had to go to a computer cable shop. You had to find the place, and you had to go in, and and you had to find the guy called Bob who actually knew what, and you know what an RS-232 <laughs> cable would look like and go and find you one and stuff. Um, these days, all cables you need are everywhere. They're in airports, in every corner. There is no cable you could need that you cannot just grab. Um, it's, and pretty soon we won't need any cables. And that feeling that technology is everywhere is important. It's funny because actually at the train station where I go, there's a vending machine that sells iPhone cables and things like that. It, it, is, it is the nature of how, I don't know if American Gods was particularly prescient, but it is true that all of the things that I described in the book are still around only more so. So the technical boy is still the technical boy, only more so. I thought it was really interesting because in um, View from the Cheap Seats, you're talking about American Gods, and you say that your goal with it was to explore the soul of America. And I was just curious if your thoughts about the soul of America have changed at all uh, since the most recent presidential election. 
You know, I don't know that the soul of America has changed particularly. There are definitely parts of the soul of America that I thought were gone. Um, I thought were history. Um, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, I thought that was the kind of thing that would only happen a long time ago. Um, the, uh, you know, the anti-Irish immigration sentiments um, on the other coast around the same time. That, that's the kind of thing that you go, okay, well, this is part of history. It's part of the American soul, but it's part of history. And watching um, the, the kind of strange anti-immigrant stuff that's happening now playing out is uh, it's certainly a wake-up call. I mean, you're an immigrant yourself, right? Does that really, does that give you some unique perspective, you think, on this whole anti-immigration phenomenon? I definitely, well, I, I think it definitely gives me a perspective, probably not a unique one. Um, I, American Gods is an immigrant book. Uh, it's a book by an immigrant about what it means to come to this country, which is something that the ancestors of everybody here did in one way or another. You know, some of them some of them came seeking freedom or economic wealth. Some of them were brought here against their will. Some of them um, were monstrously, you know, shipped out here as slaves. Some of them were sent out here as prisoners. The the ancestors of the people who were living here, uh, you know, they they came over in little boats across the land bridge twenty thousand years ago. Um, everybody, you know, the country was empty. The land was empty and everybody came here from somewhere. Um, but it's definitely not as comfortable. The, just the simple act of entering America right now is a slightly strange one if you have, as I do, not an American passport. I don't know if you saw there was this recent Entertainment Weekly story where it said American Gods just became the most important show on TV. I don't know, were you ever expecting that to, to be the kind of reviews you'd be getting? No. <laughs> I, mean, I, you know, I, I could expand on that slightly, but no. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm um, astonished. I'm delighted. I'm slightly weirded out. I kind of wish that the country had not moved to a point in which people are saying we're the most political show were the most important point. I would, I would trade some of the importance and, and the politics. I would trade it for um, a slightly more comfortable world to live in. Slightly more reassuring one, uh, perhaps one in which people take a little more seriously the little poem written on the base of the Statue of Liberty. I mean, do you do you you would hope, right, that shows like American Gods would have a, you know, a healthy effect on the country, right? Do you think that there's hope for that that people will will watch shows like this and develop a little bit more empathy for the immigrant experience? I always hope that fiction will help people develop empathy. Fiction is, a, is an empathy machine when done right. So. You know, it's allowing people to look out through other eyes. And that's what I have. What do you sort of make of this this current landscape where American Gods can be turned into this kind of high profile TV series and The Walking Dead and Game of Thrones are some of the most popular shows on TV? Is that does that surprise you as a as a longtime fantasy and science fiction author? No, actually, it, none of it surprises me. Um, it always felt like uh, it, it always felt like people loved this stuff. I would see how it sold. I would see people's reactions. Uh, the problem in the past tended to be the cost of doing it well, because if you are imagining worlds and you are imagining universes and you are imagining things, then they're easy to do on the page and they're really hard to do on the screen convincingly and trying to convince network executives who are never the most 
imaginative people or movie executives who are never the most imaginative people that things are going to be weird and wonderful. It's hard. Um, but I always figured we'd get here in the end. Hmm. And we did. I mean, I know that American Gods was in development for a long time. Would you say that you've uh, you've learned any lessons from this experience that you could pass on to other novelists whose books get adapted for the for TV? You know, I I'm old enough and I've been doing this long enough that I am never going to sweat over a year or two here and there. Coraline uh, was sold the rights to Coraline to the movies 10 years before the movie came out. Um, and it came out at the perfect time and was the perfect movie when it did. Uh, with American Gods, if we'd made it earlier, it wouldn't be this show right now, which may be when we need it most. Um, I mean, one thing that you said once that has always really stuck with me is you're talking about this trip to China you took for the science fiction convention. Could you talk about that? Sure. Uh, it was in 2007, and a bunch of American writers, and in this context I classified as an American writer, uh, came out to Chengdu to a science fiction convention, which was the first party approved, first sort of officially sanctioned uh, science fiction convention that China had ever had. And uh, it was it was really thrilling to get to meet these these Chinese science fiction writers, um, the Chinese fans. And uh, at one point, I wound up talking to one of the party officials who had organized the convention, because this wasn't a fan organized convention. And I said, where does this come from? What's going on here? And he said, well, it's like this. We, um, we knew that we were behind in creating things. Here in China, we make amazing things, but most of the amazing things we make, iPhones and things, we make because people come to us from the West and say, here, make us this amazing thing, and then we make it. We make it better, we make it cheaper, and we make it well, but we weren't creating the stuff. And China has a history of creating amazing stuff. You know, years ago, we came up with paper, we came up with gunpowder. Um, he said, so we went out and we went and talked to Google and we talked to the people at Apple and we talked to the people at Microsoft and the people who worked there, the people who were creating things. And one of the things that we discovered talking to them was that all of these people who were inventing uh, the future, they'd all read science fiction and fantasy as children as and when young. So we decided that maybe it wasn't a bad thing. Up until that point, science fiction had been very much disapproved of by, by the party, by the Communist Party. It had never been banned, but it had not been, been looked on kindly. And at that point, it's like, okay, we are willing to look on this thing kindly. Let's have a science fiction convention. I mean, have there been any updates on that situation? Have you heard anything about there have been more uh, science fiction going on in China or more, um, you know, innovative uh, patterns of thought or anything like that? Well, there, there's obviously a lot more science fiction um, going on in China these days. And, uh, you know, the book Three Body Problem, um, by which is um, by Liu Shishen, um, is, is amazing. Um, and uh, no, we're getting a lot of fantastic science fiction coming out of China now. I mean, if that's true, you think that, that more fantasy and science fiction means more innovation? Do you think that now that, as we were saying, there are the most popular shows are like American Gods and Walking Dead and Game of Thrones. Do you think there will be a new wave of innovation in America as well? One can but hope. <laughs> All right, great. So I also really wanted to have, obviously, the, the show is called Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. So obviously, we're big Douglas Adams fans. And in View from the Cheap Seats, you're talking about Douglas Adams. And you said that 
that you don't think he was really a writer exactly, that he was some sort of communicator of ideas that we don't have a word for yet. And it just made me wonder. Yes, if he... I, actually, what I said was he was, he was definitely a writer. What I said that I didn't think he was, was a novelist, um, which is slightly different. Um, but he, he wasn't a science fiction writer and he wasn't a novelist. Um, but I think he was something that we, we really don't have a word for. He was an explainer. He was a, a demonstrator. He was somebody who could show you things that you thought you understood in a way that suddenly made it clear. I was sort of wondering, you know, since I'm since I do this podcast, if you think maybe Douglas Adams was maybe more by nature a podcaster or a, a YouTube personality or something, and he was just ahead of his time too much. I think Douglas. Um, I wish Douglas was here because I think Douglas, possibly more than anybody currently living, would be able to look at the the strange place we're in right now and go, this is what's going on. And we would go, all right, we understand. And I know I do not. I mean, do you think he would be doing a podcast or be on YouTube? Or how do you think that he would maybe make use of some of these new technologies? I think Douglas would probably be out there right now in virtual reality. I think he'd probably be doing virtual reality stuff. The stuff that's happening in virtual reality is is way, way, way out there on the edge, and it feels like uh, it feels like it's a new, completely new art form. Um, I some of the guys from Oculus um, come and meet me after a gig I did in in Seattle a few weeks ago and show me. And, and sort of show off. It's like, here's stuff that we can do. Here's stuff we can do. And I had experienced earlier generation Oculus stuff. But this was, this was full virtual reality. And, and you could create art. That you were creating um, only by, uh, you know, it was special art. Um, It's sort of hard to explain. I think Douglas will be doing that kind of stuff. I, I mean, could you say sort of what the, you said you can do this and you can do that in virtual reality? What were kind of the things that they were showing uh, you that well, interested? I think my, the, I love the fact that there was art that didn't exist, or I guess you could 3D print it, but even if you 3D printed it, um, some of the materials would be impossible and this visual effect would be impossible to create. And even if you did that, it would have weight, which the stuff there was, there was a thing they did where you could extrude, essentially you're extruding foam in virtual reality and then sculpting the foam, coloring it in, giving it texture, giving it shape. And uh, it wasn't the normal way that you think of, creating things, uh, creating art in, in, in a virtual world of, of polygons and filling in the polygons and stuff. This was much more, this was, this was much more akin to, to actual sculpting, but sculpting in a zero G world with magical stuff that became whatever you needed it to be. It's interesting because I'd never really used any VR stuff before, but one of my friends had some. So uh, two or three weekends ago, I was using it. I was playing this game where I was shooting at alien robots, and I dodged so violently that I actually pulled the whole thing out of the wall uh, and killed the whole system. Mm -hmm. So that, that That's kind of the thing that I mean. It's a thing where, well, that's one of the other things. I mean, it's not so much the art, but playing around with some of the things where you're going there is one part of my brain that knows that I am standing here wearing a helmet and some weird gloves. And the rest of my brain is going, that may be true, but hell, that thing is coming towards you. And of course you can't step off here because you would fall 2000 feet and die. And, uh, and all you, all you need to do to make this thing happen is to wave or to point or whatever. And it's very, very strange. Mm -hmm. I'm also just curious because, you know, I do this podcast where I interview authors a lot. And in View from the Cheap Seats, you talk about interviewing all sorts of really big name authors, Stephen King and Robert Silverberg and Gene Wolfe. 
And I was just wondering if you had any advice about how to go about interviewing authors. Um, don't have a list of questions. Or if you do have a list of questions, always start with the things that you genuinely want to know and then ask your follow-up questions. Listen to what they say and ask your follow-up questions because that's always that was always the thing that drove me nuts when I was being interviewed. Um, if somebody would have a list of questions and I would give them an answer, and if I was the interviewer, I would have said, you know, it's the equivalent of where did you come up with the idea for the book? And they would say, well, I was, you know, chasing hippopotamuses. And, and then... And you want to go, where were you chasing hippopotamuses? Why? What kind of hippopotamuses? Do you mm -hmm. often chase hippopotamuses? Is this a thing that you do? And instead, the person would simply go on to the next question. You go, no, 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 no. You have to listen. Um, but I think mostly, um, mostly authors, you know, we're a strange reclusive breed. We either, you know, we're, we're happiest making stuff up in a world that we control. Right. I mean, the thing that I always find really challenging is when I, whenever I'm preparing to interview an author, I always have a hundred questions I want to ask, and then I, you know, narrow it down to twenty or something, and, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm not even going to get through all these questions, and let alone asking stuff that's not even, you know, on my list here. It's uh, that's that's the big challenge for me. And and it's always going to be. And, but, you know, and in order to do a good interview, you always have to let it go wherever it's going to take you. Uh, I was also just curious about in a uh, view from the cheap seats, you're talking about how I think it's an introduction to a Cory Doctorow book. And you said that you became concerned that it might not be possible to make a living selling words anymore and that you were started doing public events to kind of see um, if that was another sort of an alternative career. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk about what, if you came to any conclusions about what made those evening with Neil Gaiman events work the best. Um, yeah, it was, it was one of those things where I definitely, uh, you know, 10 years ago, looking around and going, I don't know if what happens in music happens in in books, which actually it didn't for a number of reasons, although it could still go there and it could have gone there. Um, and it's really, really hard to sell the thing. Um, then what you need to be able to give people is a unique experience because a unique experience will always be, they will always come in for a unique thing. And that was the point where I thought, well, Dickens, when he had copyright troubles in America uh, and wasn't getting paid for his work over here because it was all getting pirated, what he did was just come and do readings. And I thought, well, that's, that worked for him, you know, 150 years ago. Let me, let me see if it will work for me now. And, uh, and went out and did, and did readings. And I still do a few a year. Um, I'm actually, I've never had any trouble yet making, uh, making a perfectly happy income through selling books and selling my words. But I can imagine that one day I would. All right. So unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time. So I guess just my uh, final question here is the American Gods show is going to uh, debut on April 30th, which is Valpurgis Noct. And I was just curious if that was planned or if it just kind of uh, fell out that way. Uh, no, it just came out that way. And I, but I love, um, I love that it did. And, um, and I love the fact that in the rest of the world, it's debuting on May 1st, which is May Day, which also seems incredibly appropriate. So we get the night when the witches dance. And then we get the night of the fertility and dancing around the day of fertility and dancing around maples. And both of those seem ridiculously appropriate for our show. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. So we've been speaking with Neil Gaiman. And again, don't miss this new show, American Gods, which premieres on Stars on April 30th. So, Neil, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. That was really fun. And that was our interview. 
So big thanks again to Neil Gaiman for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Stephen Fender, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.